about the future, the history of video on the internet, to some degree, you could argue that John's belief in video when he ran Cisco is one of the reasons why video has become so important in our lives. And if you think of all the things that Cisco did when he was there, built telepresence, uh, by WebEx, um, and, and tons of infrastructure advances that were designed to support a video infrastructure. Um, so that was something, you know, John's many decades running Cisco. So nothing's too fun at the moment though, and that's a reason why we wanted John to talk about crises right now, because clearly we're in a crisis that is unprecedented and scary and absolutely unpredictable. Um, John is a great person to talk to in that situation because since he ran Cisco for so many decades through, through an astonishing number of crises, which those older people among us will remember, used to be more common. Uh, and I'm going to ask John to talk about that. And, and I know, John, you, you said you've been through five major economic crises. I can't even count five, um, but 87, 97 Asian financial crisis, 2001, 2008, and I'm forgetting maybe one more. What is the other one, John? Uh, this one. This one, okay, the fifth one. Well, okay, so you've been through four before and you're gonna help us get through this, this one. Basically, what have you learned? Let's start with that. <laughs> Having gone through those yeah. crises, did, did you come up with a, any kind of a playbook that we could all be learning from now? Uh, yes, David, and part of it is so important because as you said before, the crisis financially at least used to occur closer together. So you had many leaders who were in a senior leadership position and they saw multiple of these. And unfortunately, each time you see one, you learn how to navigate through it, assuming you survive the challenges. And we've gone 12 years without a challenge. So during the discussion today, I will share with you what I think the playbooks need to be, uh, where I add value. Uh, I will uh, try to give examples because you taught me stories people remember. If I just list a bunch of data points, people will have trouble with it in terms of direction. And so the, the first rule of crisis management and crisis, whether it's financial, uh, whether it's a, a pandemic from the healthcare perspective, supply chain, or a combination of the above, which it is today, is don't hide. Leaders have to be very visible. Uh, you have to be very transparent. And uh, you also need to be comfortable, which often new leaders are not, uh, if they're new into their job, regardless of their age, with saying, I don't know on certain issues. The second thing you do is you want to be very realistic how much of the issues you're currently facing were self-inflicted and how much were on a larger scale externally inflicted. This is largely an external uh, challenge, but I would not underestimate for companies a number of them who might have been having troubles before, they must address both their internal and their external challenges. Then you come up with, I like odd numbers, as you know, three, five, seven major programs or uh, areas where you're going to focus that will prepare you for how you will come out of this crisis. And they need each one of them to remove the needle. You shouldn't do that. And it can be everything from how you're going to manage expenses to how you interface to your customers to how uh, you use this opportunity perhaps to reinvent yourself as you go through it. You then paint the picture for both your employees, your customers, your shareholders, the media, et cetera, and partners of what you're gonna look like when you come out. And that is so important because that's your North Star you maintain all the way through the changes that occur. Then you give regular updates, especially to your employees, but also to your customers, to your shareholders, your partners, the media on it. And you hope for the best, but you need to plan for the worst. These crises tend to usually be longer than you think and deeper than you think. Using my words, probably three to five quarters minimum for the crisis. And when I started saying that a couple months ago, people said, no, we're going to be in and out. I think that's more the median now. Some people saying longer, some people saying shorter. And then you learn to share the stories because the stories are what you remember. So lessons on crisis, David, if I could jump into one, let's do 1997, uh, 98, the Asian financial crisis, tiger economies started crashing and almost all technology companies pulled out of those countries. Well, I came out of Wang Laboratories. I know my Asian counterparts will remember for life how they're treated during the tough times. 
And so at the time everybody pulled out, I sent my best sales leader over to Asia. Uh, we doubled down on our resources, fired through the downturn, and a year later we were number one in every country and we never gave it up. Uh, 2001, I got caught by surprise. I kept doing the right thing too long. My numbers had never lied to me in terms of what I got in the first week of a month and the first month of a quarter. We give me exactly how I'd end up. Uh, and we never, during 20 years and 80 conferences, uh, conference calls, ever missed our earnings projection, even though 80% of the business was new. These numbers just always were right. But all of a sudden, I was growing in 1999 at 70% year over year. Wow. And the first week and the third week in January, minus 30. I'd never grown below 50%. That was a survival crisis. And so you walk through this playbook again and again on it. We made all of our changes quickly. And to the people listening that run businesses, don't do it a step at a time. It will exhaust your employees and your customers and your shareholders. If you got to make changes, do it once, do it deeper than you think, and then position yourself for the outcome. We made the decision to make the changes one night after I traveled for two weeks there in January. I called up my leadership team and said, we're going to be in the office at 630 tomorrow. And at one o'clock, we announced to the market, we were going to completely transform the company, that we were going to unfortunately do a major layoff of 7,000 people, that here's what we were going to focus on. Our strategy was working well going in. It's going to work well coming out. And we positioned ourselves for the future. And we made all the changes in 51 days. Day 52, we gained market share. Most, in fact, all my peers didn't even take action in that time period. And I wish I was wrong when I said a hundred year flood and you probably would have told me not to use that uh, type of uh, words because the media of course had a lot of fun with me <laughs> in a very tough way. And it was the loneliest year of my life. And it's important to understand it's okay to have doubts. It's okay to be lonely. This is where if you can have people you trust, you can go to, but you learn from each one. 2007. Well, for, the people who are, for the many people on this call who are too young to remember, uh, 2001 business situation. What? Uh, how much did Cisco's stock decline during that period? Over 80 percent. We went from the most valuable company in the world to, and candidly, I was. I, I'm not sure I deserve this at all, uh, in any way. But one of the top CEOs people thought ever to should I have my job? And uh, it's that challenge that you have to learn. It is the lonely time. Shimon Perez taught me that. He said, "John, leadership is lonely." The prior president of Israel. I said, Shimon, it's not lonely. I got 40,000 people around me. He said, in tough times, you will be by yourself. And he was right. But you learn from each one. And this is why, David, the point about getting people that you can bounce ideas off of. In 2007, guess what? My numbers were really good. Summer, except that my top eight banks in the U.S. all slowed down at the same time order rate-wise. I called the CEOs and they said, no, John, just a little bit of caution. Well, eight don't get cautious at the same time. I said, I think we're headed for a financial problem. Uh, and I shared that on my earnings call, even though we exceeded it, the stock went down. But 2008 came very quickly, the Great Recession. And by the way, we pirated through it. And during the middle of 2008, we gave back to our automotive customers. We literally extended credit at a time that no one else would. And when we emerged from that, not only was our company by itself, every automotive company in the world was locked into Cisco as a partner. So my point is, you deal with the world the way it is. We all wish this were differently, but you analyze it very, very much like a doctor does. Uh, don't focus on the symptoms, focus on the underlying issues. How do you get the patient back well? And how do you position yourself to go through this tough time? And don't underestimate it. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. John, one of the things that's so interesting about your life right now is that you have 18 startups you're deeply involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's really how you're spending most of your time right now. Yes. So I think you're, you're in a unique position to kind of compare the big company, small company dichotomy in this scenario. So could you talk a little bit about that? How, how do you see big companies versus startups responding and how should they respond differently? Well, the point that you're leading me to, David, and we won't always agree. And by the way, if your audience agrees with everything we say today, it will be disappointing. I want to make people a little bit uncomfortable, challenge their thought process, et cetera. But the playbook is remarkably similar. The small companies have an ability to move faster, and they probably will. Uh, but to the point that Josh just made in that survey, we aren't even, if you're a baseball fan, in the first inning. 
we literally have just gotten up. We've had a couple pitches. Uh, your leadership has not started to make the tough decisions yet. The tough decisions about repositioning the company. The tough decisions about, unfortunately, do you do a layoff? Uh, the decisions about uh, what they're going to cut and not do. The decisions about making some big bets during the tough time that if she or he is wrong, could have a real problem for the company. The decisions about how they deal with the openness of the employees uh, on asking tough questions and do they really create an environment of constant uh, give and take and do they receive criticism well. We're just, just getting started. The numbers are good and that was actually a little bit better than I thought, but I, it'd be a fun one, David, if you end up doing this with this group regularly to put that same chart back up and watch how it changes as a percent over time, hopefully for the better, but if I were projecting the future, probably for the tougher time period. So many companies, David, are already running out of cash. So many companies are having to make a decision to lay off or not to lay off. Uh, and even though our government's moving the fastest I've ever seen it move, and the Federal Reserve deserves huge credit for moving as well, merely getting the loans out there, uh, a number of companies uh, may be in trouble with an ability to not recover uh, in as quickly as a month because next quarter is going to be an ugly quarter. Uh, you know, people are putting the uh, foot on the brakes really, really hard. It would not surprise me to see the average startup orders fall by 50%. Some of them will power through this if they do call savings uh, and they focus where they can really help the companies do well. But if you're in an area of innovation that the company can delay the decision for six or 12 months, uh, your sales will slow dramatically. Tell us what you're telling those 18 companies that you're working Okay, on. so let's, let's do the large companies. They will be the most insulated in the short term. They clearly already, many of them, have a large cash uh, accumulation. The large companies are already drawing down on their lines of credit so they can get it out of the banks and into their checking account. And so in the short term, they are the most insulated. Uh, however, if you watch 10 years from now, and David, you and I have talked about this, 40% of those large companies won't exist. And this will dramatically accelerate it. And that number might be even more challenging. Within the startups, uh, I think you need to think about them perhaps in three category groups. Startups that are really fundamental to the changes going on, areas such as perhaps uh, the ability to do major cost savings in the uh, call centers, an example, uh, which I have three companies in that area. Uh, I'd be surprised if they don't continue to grow at 50 to 150 percent throughout this year. Uh, areas that are cool technology that can really help a company be successful three and four years out will uh, not do as well in the short term because people will delay those decisions. And then it also depends how broad your customer base is as a startup. If you're very early stage with really unique products on digitization, then it's very likely you'll get to Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm, early innovators and early adopters, and you'll do fine through this. So I think in each of these categories, you're gonna have different degrees of success. In the short term, startups, cash, major problem. Long terms, it actually might be the big companies that have the most challenges. What about consumer oriented versus B2B? The B2B gets the uh, foot down much quicker on the uh, decisions. Most CEO, CFOs and CEOs have already put their brakes on and said, let's just pause and watch to see what's happening. On the consumer, there are certain staples that you have to do. For example, from what I understand, some of the retail stores that might surprise you, a Home Depot, et cetera, might be doing very well through this as the people are at home and want to remodel their house, et cetera, uh, on it. So I think it very much depends on which segment of the consumer and which segment of the B&B &B on it. But what we're all saying is there's no shoe, one shoe that fits all sizes. This is right. where when you listen, you use your experience, then you go to your customers. They will tell you, if you listen right, what they're going to do. Well, looking at my questions, since you've said so many great things at the outset, there's only a few more things we need to touch on. I know we're close to wanting to go to the audience, but, or whatever we call them, but, um, I think it would be useful for you to talk a little bit specifically about a couple of the startups you've been advising and what they've done, what you've told them to do or what they've decided to do, what you've been impressed by, maybe if they're one or two that you sort of think have blundered, what would you, what would you tell this crowd? 
Well, the thing about startups is the CEOs themselves know how fast they must move to survive as a startup. And just to give you a background, I look at startups that I'm going to bet you know, my, my, my brand on in two, four or five categories. Uh, do they catch a business transition going on in the market enabled by a new technology, such as the call centers that I talked about earlier, enabled by artificial intelligence, or feeding the world with uh, insects uh, by the Internet of Things type capability, or a security type company. I then pick a very sharp CEO who really, really wants to be coached. And if you look at most venture capitalists, they will tell you the number one ingredient in their success of a company or not is did the CEO who did the initial funding with them also be the one to take them public. I look for them to be one or two in their area and near an inflection point. I look for them and the customers say good thing about on the management team. So the CEO during these downturns, what they do is they've got to show where their vision and strategy is, their plan to deal with it. They've got to go back to their core culture and their few communications. We talked earlier about revenue streams, but we're absolutely most proud and I'll use just two examples, Bloom Energy, uh, KR there, uh, rocket scientists, literally. Uh, all of us are going through uh, challenging times with how we distribute energy, et cetera. They spent yesterday in their factory building 200 respirators that were damaged so that they could be used as the virus patients come into hospitals. This is why you need manufacturing in the U.S. They were able to take those and put it through, and they could perhaps do 2,000 more, which can save you know, unfortunately thousands of lives as we go forward uh my cricket company you know this one very well in terms it gets a of, lot of publicity every time you talk about it john because people say what crickets yeah and they Not crossed crickets. the chasm just uh, a year and a half ago david they almost didn't survive we barely got funding came very close to having to change muhammad Asher, who's a, an amazing young ceo he now has his financing in place, actually government working with him as well, and he's crossed the chasm and it's gonna have a great future. He made a decision, even though his business was slowing short term, to keep all 12 hourly employees on, even though he only needed three or four, because he knew they could not get a job otherwise. He couldn't have done that 18 months ago, but he did it this time. My key takeaway with the story, you learn a lot about people, how they manage under stress, and it's just beginning to get stressful. <laughs> and so when we say how our CEOs are doing, it's a little bit early to judge them. Too early. Initial That's reaction is key. But what I was the most proud, they did culture. And so I want companies who are going to be great companies, but also with social responsibility. And that's how I hopefully selected the companies. Made me very proud. Thank you, John. C considering how stressed out so many of us feel already, the idea it could get worse is a little disturbing, but I'll pass over Well, that. I'll send you some crickets, David, if that helps you a little bit. <laughs> That, uh, that where I can see might cheer me up. Uh, shakes. I, I would <laughs> actually eat them. I had a few before. Uh, I know Josh is being uh, sort of pummeled with questions. And so barrage, I, with questions. I, barrage is a good word. So uh, let's hear some of those. Okay, great. You're gonna, what you're going to do is give them a chance to ask their own questions, right, Josh? How yeah, and, and you know, as I said, everyone's sort of right now texting me questions. Um, obviously, I'm going to try to get as many voices in here. So. I'm, I'm assuming the question you're going to text me is the quick question you're going to ask. So That's what we uh, expect, yes. So um, I'm going to first go over, let's see, I'm going to, Shannon Lucas, your mic is on. Great. Thank you for the hey, fantastic conversation. Hey, um, I'm wondering what role, if any, you think universal basic income will play in the new future? I mean, we obviously saw the $1,200 going out to most Americans right now. Like, is this the new normal? Well, it's probably going to be somewhere between the two. Uh, the speed of the downturn, Shannon, is going to be brutal. This next quarter, uh, I, I hope I'm very wrong, but I think it's going to be the fastest GDP decrease we've ever seen during our lifetime. And you must get out there to protect every citizen uh, because so many companies aren't going to have the cash flow to survive, much less pay all their employees. And many people in this gig economy were actually independent agents. And so I think in the interim, you have to make a decision to help every American that you can. Don't get tangled up in the longer term politics, Democrat or Republican. Deal with the issue. We're in the emergency room. Let's save the patient. Let's help the average American who no longer, 40% of Americans didn't know where to go for $500 unexpected. They never dreamed all of a sudden they might not have a job and they can't go get another job. 
And so I think it's very important to provide that income now, but don't get into politics about is this a long-term solution or not? Let's get the patient out of the emergency room. Let's get them healthy. And then let's deal on the longer-term issues and what we learn from this. Is that fair? I got a related question. John, are you in the camp that believes that basically government can spend as much as needed and we shouldn't worry about the debt? No. Uh, am I in the camp that believes government must spend whatever it takes to get it turned around very yeah. quickly? Absolutely. Should we worry about the debt? Absolutely. Because somebody has to pay it back. And so... How well, modern monetary the theory supposedly suggests the opposite of that. that. Maybe we don't, we can sort of just print money when we need it. Yeah, we've all seen the effects of that in inflation. Yeah, and the inflation has not been an issue for almost all the leaders on this call today. Uh, inflation is a bear when you get into it. But bottom line, am I in the camp that government must spend whatever it takes to support the citizens to prevent the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of small businesses that will be out, that will have to close shop in the next month and a half if they don't help them. Absolutely, and I'm convinced that central banks have to do whatever it takes to get us back up, not just with the, uh, uh, the Fed rates, et cetera, but also in the quantitative easing, absolutely. But then you've got to also say, after we do this, don't stay addicted to it. You're gonna to have to say, how do we get back our house back in order? But the first thing is to get that country back healthy again. I think the country was in good shape going into this. Not great, but good. And the first thing you do is if your economy was creating 275,000 jobs last month is don't go change everything. Focus on how do we get back to where we were and how we go forward. Coming out of it, oh, will many companies move to become a digital company? Oh, yes. Great. Um, well, let's go over to, uh, to someone I think you know. Uh, Diane Brady had a question. Hey, Hi, Diane. Hi. How are you? I think you know her very well. Very Hi. well. Diane was my co-author, and she taught me, David, how to tell stories and not just net it out with tough you love. To no, and, thank you. And for um, those well, of you great on, to see you. you. Go ahead, Dan. Um, and, uh, you know, John, I wanted to ask not so much if you were leading Cisco, but if you were leading a large enterprise right now, what would you be doing in the short term? but also in the long term to survive, thrive, and what mistakes should we be looking for as investors or otherwise? Well, the mistakes are those that overreact or underreact. Secondly, uh, when you move, as I alluded to earlier, move one time decisively, uh, those companies who do it a step at a time will exhaust their shareholders, their employees, and others. Uh, this might surprise you. Normally, I'm a believer in moving right now, However, I think we're going to know a lot more in 30 to 45 days. Mm -hmm. Do we flatten that curve, uh, which means hopefully we will. And then you get a lot more predictability of what the economy will look like later in the summer, et cetera. So I think most large companies will tighten their belts very, very quickly. Uh, if, I, if I were running one now, uh, I would say make this decision 45 days from now. And that's exactly what I'm telling my other companies. However, paint the picture of what it looks like on the other side and then say, what are you going to do dramatically different and deal with the things you're already weak on. Don't use this as a cover up that you already had problems in your company and you're not going to address those at the same time. Um, great, great work with you, Dan. Love you, uh, by the way. Let's go over, we had a question from, uh, from Bruce Brandfong. You should be unmuted now. Thanks, thank you, Josh. Hey, John, uh, hey, thank Bruce. you so much. for. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as a uh, longtime media hand, uh, my question is about the media, <clears throat> yes. which has in, been in a desperate, desperate um, situation for quite a few years now, uh, thanks to our uh, lovely internet. Um, what, how does the public's perception, or what is the public's perception about the media coming out of this crisis, and will it change as a consequence? Uh, your, your question is a loaded question, but I will answer it. <laughs> uh, it basically, it depends on how the media handles it. I think if the media uh, focuses on how does this country back, get back healthy, how do we realize that Democrats and Republicans both have good ideas on this, uh, that shares the successes and talks about the successes and reinforce government taking risk, and you know, really opening that pocketbook up as opposed to being critical and second guessing each move. Uh, I think the media has a chance to perhaps regain part of its trust and confidence that's missing in so much of America today. 
if the media makes the same mistake that uh, it becomes very political on both sides, that they slow down the process, critical when people take risks, people won't take risks. If they publicize mainly the negatives and the negative outcome, not the successes, not the uh, uh, union companies that really make a difference uh, during the tough times, Bloom that I talked about earlier, Aspera Foods that we talked about in terms of uh, you know, Mohammed's uh, company, uh, then I think you can control your own destiny. So I would do both. I think it's so important the media regain the trust of America's on all political sides. And I strongly encourage my Democrats and Republicans, let's make this one united country. Let's fix this problem. It is probably the biggest challenge that we've ever seen as a country. I think if we really work together, we can not only win, we can win it in a shorter time period than most people anticipate, perhaps as quick as three to quarters if we get lucky on controlling the virus spread. Would you agree with that or disagree? I'm watching your reaction. Yeah, no, I, I love video. I, 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 you know, I, I completely concur, right? I mean, we've lost our confidence in the media because it's become so polarized. And I don't know whether yes. that's the media's fault or uh, the audience's fault. Um, All the we've, <laughs> we've, we've, we've retreated to our own echo chambers, right? And, and part, of the, part of the reason is because the, the sort of the, 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 the credible, important media in the country has had to fight a battle for audience that's been lost to uh, uh, Facebook, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, you know, and, and the free media survives by, by, by getting paid for the content uh, via the advertising. And that advertising has left the room uh, and gone elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, the, the ones that have been successful trying to get the audience to pay for the content, uh, uh, it's much some, tougher. It's much tougher. I agree. So what I want to do is on this one, I'd love to take this up as a separate topic. David, if you and Josh would take it, maybe four or five of us talk through, because I think it's an opportunity for traditional media to regain the leadership. But I know we got a lot of questions in the queue, Josh. I, got it. You know, I just wanted to, I also wanted to make an observation that is disturbing. If you say three quarters is fast, that takes us all the way to the new year just alone. So you're saying if we have this kind of, somehow stabilized by the new year, you think that's the optimistic scenario? I would say three quarters means by late fall uh, uh, and into the December time period is when I do three quarters. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. Many people thought this would be a quick V down and V back because again, even the investors haven't seen a problem for 12, 12 years. Uh, but no, I think this is going to be a much deeper Q2 than anybody anticipates. And GDP growth will be a number, David, that you and I have never seen in our lifetime negative. So it's going to take a while to come back from that. If we do it right, we will, and perhaps come back quicker. As I said, we had no problem with employment going into this. If we do it right coming out, this nation will once again lead if we have the courage to lead. And if we as citizens, to the point that several of your colleagues made, if we are also willing to say, let's force people to work together. And how do we win together and take risk? I'm going to try to do my best to lead startups out of this. I'm talking to one of the top VCs in the country on Monday to all their startups about how do you manage through this. I'm going to use my own 18 as an example. And I'm on the phone every other day to them on how do you handle this? How do you make the decisions? When do you move? What are your customers doing? And so I want to make a difference. And uh, uh, it's one that I, I, unfortunately, I've seen the movies so many times. I can usually provide pretty good advice on what not to do and what to do. Thanks. Josh? I mean, myself. Uh, I'm going to uh, shoot it over to uh, Aaron Cranmer from BSR in a second. Aaron, you're on. Hi. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, uh, John. Hey, Aaron. <clears throat> um, good to see you again. Good to see you, too. Um, the, um, the discussion so far has been very much U.S. focused, which I understand, but uh, don't we need business leaders to stand up to sustain and strengthen support not only for a globalized response here, but to sustain support for an open rules-based global economy? Well, you've asked three or four questions. Let me take them in the sequence. First, uh, you, most of the audience probably doesn't know, uh, I'm uh, President Macron in France, uh, global high-tech ambassador. And can you imagine the U.S. having a German uh, or a French ambassador? It shows you how countries are changing. And Europe will be probably the second hardest hit areas. I've seen GDP negative perhaps in the, the low 20s for the, uh, the next quarter, uh, implications. Uh, same thing in Asia. Uh, I am uh, 
Prime Minister Modi has been very kind on his comments about being his global ambassador in many ways, working closely with him on his country digitization startup agenda. Uh, they are, if I were betting on one economy in Asia, actually I bet on India. Uh, and so you've got to say which economies can lead, and this is where leadership matters. Uh, people have to have others they follow. How South Korea dealt with this virus was probably the model the U.S. has now learned to follow. Uh, how perhaps if France leads the way here, or if Germany does or the U.K., how the other countries can learn, or ideally, how do they do it together? Uh, you and China made some tough decisions. It looks like they got the pandemic under control. They will get hit the hardest. Uh, in my opinion, this next quarter. So calendar quarter, second quarter, Asia will be tough with China being hit the hardest and so many countries dependent upon it. But a global response there. But I'm gonna go back to the bigger issue. I think it's so important we don't get tied up around the axle in terms of uh, at the bigger issues that are very difficult to solve, trying to solve those at the time we're still in the emergency room. Let's get the patient back healthy. Let's do it as a united group. Let's realize we're going to make some mistakes along the way. Let's talk about the successes and what we learned from the mistakes. And then as we get healthy, let's go back and have an honest debate where people really listen. My, around my grandparents' table and with my uncles, we argued Democrats and Republicans back and forth, and it was fun. And at the end, we were still friends. Now, they don't talk to each other. Let's, let's get back to what made America great, which is having open correlation. Let's dream together how we lead this country back out of this quickly. My pleasure. Okay. Um, John, there's been a bunch of questions coming in about the response by the healthcare system and hospital systems. Any sort of feedback on how you think healthcare may have to change uh, moving forward? Well, I think the healthcare system, first, the people that are responding, I've been amazed how they've done that, not only in this country, but around the world. In many ways, taking risks where they're actually making their own masks. Many of the doctors actually get in sick themselves. It shows you how great the people in our healthcare system, both here in the U.S. and around the world, have been. But it also shows you an industry that has not reinvented itself. And uh, to think that we can solve it by we just need twice the number of beds is not the issue. Uh, we have to think about how we use technology and how we get our healthcare system ready for an aging population, but also one that can respond to demands going up and down much quicker. So I think the people have been amazing here on their commitments and the local hospitals and the CDC, and I watched what Stanford Hospital has been doing and Lucille Packard, uh, very high marks. But to the point that was raised earlier, as we come out of this, we probably need to revisit the whole healthcare system approach and how do you prepare for pandemics? And you're not gonna solve it doing it the way we did before build more hospitals with more beds that go unutilized 70% of the time. So thinking about it more creatively and how to use technology, I personally think is the answer. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we have Jane, oh, Jane, her iPhone. I'm not sure if you have uh, video here. Let me see if uh, we can get Jane on. We have Jane's iPhone and Jane's iPad. Let's see, Jane's iPhone is unmuted if you want to ask your question. Uh, Jane? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, John. Hey, Jane. Jane, it's a pleasure. Um, John, I know you. Um, I uh, was responsible for setting up the Cisco Networking Academy in the UK and Ireland. Oh, thank you. Probably the most successful corporate give back program ever. Seven Absolutely. million students trained. The most, uh, and I still, even though I left Cisco six years ago, I still have such passion for what Cisco did and what they still do around education. So uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately in my head, I now run uh, an organization which, um, encourages more students to come to the UK to take degrees and, and still working very much with the Cisco Academies around the world so that they could get dual um, qualifications. Uh, okay. what, I, what, I, what I wanted to ask you is how you think, because education still hasn't changed a great deal within universities and, and uh, schools and colleges. How do we get them to really, really embrace, and I've done this for 20 years, how do we get them to really embrace technology 
um, so that you know in times like this students do not miss out and and they get such enrichment from going on to technology so I think you've hit one of the most important issues and I'll address it short term very briefly long term and then a uh, continuing conversation uh, you know, I'll use the US as an example our k-12 system is broken it isn't just using technology if you put technology into a broken system, you still get a broken outcome. We have to rethink how we train our young people so they can get the jobs of the future, how we teach them to be entrepreneurs earlier. As you know from your time at, at our prior company, we were doing that in France to address the young people throughout the nation, regardless of economic input. To your yeah. bigger question on the university level, uh, you can't have people graduating the university degree and not be able to get jobs. You've got to train them where the jobs are. And as opposed to training, i.e. in my prior generation, I was a lawyer, I was a lawyer period. Uh, I think you're gonna see some universities take big risk here. Uh, I would watch my home state, West Virginia University. Uh, what Gordon Gee, the president is doing there is amazing. Uh, Javier Reyes, who's the Dean of the Business School, uh, is taking responsibility to make the university a startup uh, architecture. We're learning how to dream. We're redoing the classes entrepreneurship will probably become a requirement for every student. We're knocking down the silos between the med school and the business school and the liberal arts. We're focusing on how do we create students that can get jobs coming out, how do you use technology for it. Jobs in West Virginia will only come through startups. There aren't any big companies. How do we get more and more startups and how do we have the ability to dream together? So yes to your question. Yes, I'd like to see us try a number of things, uh, but it's a bigger issue in terms of do we have the courage to really change? So John, you know, uh isn't there, in answer to that, was a, that question got into something that it's, you sort of referred to before, but you didn't really embrace it as much as I would have expected. The crisis is what is going to cause these institutions to change, is it not? In education, in healthcare, many, many corporations. I mean, we're, we're, we're educating people on a, you think this is fun. You, we're educating people on No, a, no, I agree. I agree, David, because what you're doing is you said, John, you missed a chance. I, I gave you a slow ball pitch down the middle and uh, you, you hit a single. You're absolutely right. People respond more to a crisis than they ever do successes. In successes, a segment of the population or a segment of countries break away. During crisis, if we deal with it right, it can be much more inclusive and people are willing to take risks because they have no choice. Why is West Virginia taking the risk I just said? We're number 48 or 49 or 50 in most categories, great people. It's why I love that song at the beginning. But if we don't take the risk, we would get left behind. And we know it. But it's amazing. My wife teaches painting at the School of Visual Arts here in Manhattan. And today she taught her first class over Zoom. And she said to me afterwards, you know, nobody's going to come out of this crisis without knowing how to use tech. And, you know, we're the more tech savvy people that are on this connection, I would suspect. But yes. there really is a massive education underway in real time. And, it, and I, I was also surprised when you said to us on the phone, and I think you mentioned it before, that only 10% of companies are really going to embrace this to go sufficiently digital. Did you say that? Yeah, I think at most. Uh, what I'm telling my startups who are mainly digital, uh, if they're not in the area of cost savings or security or an area that companies are going to spend money on in the short term, you're going to have to go get that segment of enterprise and, and medium-sized business that are going to use this to go digital. It will shock you. I bet you some of the airlines and some of the hotel companies that perhaps are under the most stress will say, I'm going to use this terrible event to digitize my company and come out of this stronger and break away. As you know, in my prior companies, we use downturns to break away. You don't gain share during the upturns, to your point. You gain it during the downturns. And so, yes, I, I, I do think that you never want to not use a crisis to change things that many of your colleagues have already brought up today uh, in society. So I agree. Sorry I missed that. That was a very gentle way of you saying, John, you missed it, but I agree. I did miss that opportunity. But, but, but I still, it, it sounds like you think a lot of companies, big companies in particular, will still fail to do that. Yes. Well, I think they'll still fail to do it in the short term. I would argue those that fail long term won't exist in 10 years. But right now, it's survival. Uh, as we said earlier, people haven't seen the movie before. Uh, if you're a CEO, especially if you're relatively new two to three years in, you take risk on doing digitization at the time that you're trying to get your company to survive. 
shareholder activists swoop in and say, you are spending money for the future. They want to maximize the return short term. Uh, this is one of the problems with our capitalistic system. We've become too short term oriented. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think I'd be pleased if we're more than 10 percent, but I think 10 percent is the right number. Uh, over time, perhaps it gets to 50 percent. And the others will get left behind, David. That one's an easy one to see the outcome on. You were mentioning the healthcare thing, and we did a session in Davos on healthcare and digital, and every single expert on the panel, and that's on our website, was yes. really angry that we've had the tools for, in some cases, a decade to digitize the healthcare system, do remote medicine, and it's just not been embraced in almost any country except a small number of the Nordics and maybe a few other places. But, but I will tell you, I had a video, video consultation with the yep. doctor on Thursday morning, and for both of us, it was the first time we'd ever done it. I know in the United States and a lot of the developed countries, one of the reasons it hasn't happened is the doctors have refused, but now they can't refuse. You've raised three or four issues, taken in the sequence you raised them. Do I think video being the primary way of communications is back in the future? Absolutely. And uh, I think it will have an impact on the healthcare system that people finally get comfortable with being willing to do. The second issue is the healthcare system, whenever they've done technology, they've done it in a silo. If you put technology, and David, you know where I'm going with this, if you put technology into an existing system that, uh, and you don't change the process, you get very little productivity. We have to knock down the silos. Both my parents were doctors. The hospital is largely organized the same way it was when they were a doctor. 70 years ago. And so we have to change the underlying process as we make these changes. And then the government has to support it, not put so many restrictions in place. There's no risk. There's no reason for somebody to take risk because it's only downside. But one that we probably could spend a whole one of these sessions on in and of itself. Well, I know Josh has at least one more question and then we're going to wrap fairly soon. But Josh, uh, take it away. Sure. Yeah, I think, John, you know, one of the questions is, you know, as you mentioned, how companies are adapting, people you know, we have a couple of people here who are in corporate social responsibility groups or philanthropy groups within big companies. You know, how will economic downturns like this shift funding and impact CSR initiatives by big companies? Thank you, Josh. That was one I was supposed to ask. Yeah. You know, it's you, to me, being honest and transparent is the most important thing. Uh, most shareholders don't, they say they want you to, but they really don't in terms of capitalism being about the you know, success of the company uh, and equally, in my opinion, important success of society. But corporate social responsibility is something most shareholders don't put a big value on. I think it's very wrong. I would argue Cisco, which my colleague pointed out earlier, won every corporate social responsibility award there was to win. And by the way, we had the best profitability of any company in our industry by far uh, on it. Uh, the programs are going to get hit, y'all. Uh, they're going to, unfortunately, many of the CEOs will say, well, we'll go back and do this later. I personally think it's a mistake because I think benefit to society, like the two examples we used earlier, culture is what makes great companies. A great culture makes a really good, great company uh, in terms of the approach. But I think there's going to be huge pressure on it. I would encourage my CEO colleagues to remember society and financial success actually go together. If we don't do a better job of balancing the two, government will intervene and they clearly sent that message. But I think in the short term, the corporate social responsibility programs will get hit by the majority of companies. I think it's wrong, but I think it will be the exception that goes back to culture. Well, John, thank you so much. I think we've taken just about the amount of time we said we would. We've had really great participation. We're really pleased that sort of our, our initial, you could call it beta or post beta uh, version of the new techonomy, because this is kind of what we are going to be doing from now on for the, at least until the third, fourth quarter, I guess. Uh, so thank you so much for helping us do that. I'm going to turn it back to Josh to come to uh, wrap up, but uh, I'll thank you also to the great bunch of people, so many friends uh, and people that I respect who are on there that we didn't get to hear from, but I hope we'll be in touch in the coming days and weeks. David and Josh, thank you for having the courage to change. It's been an honor to be your first, first guinea pig uh, in the new program. And Josh, thank you for playing Country Roads. Yeah. <laughs> and John, you know, we've had a bunch of texts about making sure we hold you to doing another one of these around media. Um, a bunch of people were interested in that. Uh, so we'll have you back, hopefully, uh, not to a distant future.